ます。<笑> Record to this way. We're both recording. Okay. Hello.、Uh, welcome. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning to everybody.、Um, welcome to the 2002 Michigan State University Japanese Pop Culture and Transmedia Workshop Roundtable. I want to thank all of you for having come to the、uh, workshop, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And today we're going to let our, our all our workshop leaders. Have a chance to talk a little bit more about themselves and their work and some of their thoughts about some things. And because we want to fill up this time and we have a lot to get through, I'm just going to get right into it. So, the first thing I'm going to do is go through each of you and I'll just call you out and ask you、uh, to please introduce yourself and briefly tell us how you got into translation. Let us begin with、um, Jennifer Sherman. Well, I majored in East Asian studies in college. And so that's how I learned Japanese. And I started working for Anime News Network,、um, basically, essentially translating news articles about Japanese pop culture stuff and like rewriting English articles.、Um, did that for to varying degrees for about 10 years and went on the JET program for four years. and... When I got back, started freelancing for Kodansha Comics and J Novel Club, and eventually got an in house position at Biz. And here I am. Excellent. Thank you very much.、Um, Zach, why don't you、uh, introduce yourself and give us an idea of how you got into it? Sure.、Uh, also, former Jet alumni.、Um, I really had nothing. I was 30 years old. I was a project manager at Amazon.com. And one day I just looked at myself and I was like, Is this it? Is this all I get out of life? Is to have a prospective job in a corporation? I decided to throw my future away and jump on a plane to Japan where I'd never been before. And I spoke no Japanese and I didn't know anything.、Um, so I went to Japan and I was like, oh, I'll go for one year. And then, like eight years later, I come home.、Um, in Japan, I discovered this I discovered that the Japan that we know in the US and actual Japan are very, very, very different. And that was a bit of a shock to me. And I really fell in love with this.、Um, This one particular comic artist, Mizugi Shigeru, I thought his works were tremendous. And he was this great pillar of Japanese culture. And I had never even heard of him before I moved there. And that was just astounding to me. And so I decided to make it my life's mission to bring this great、um, artist to the West. And I actually once stood drunkenly on a friend's bar in Osaka and raised my fist to the table and said, I shall be the one to bring Mizugi Shigeru to English. And、um, about It took me about 10 years to accomplish that, but I did do it. So there I am today, still, still、Very、working、nice. on his work. Excellent. Pachi, 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 pachi.、Uh, Sarah Moon, why don't you、uh, give us an idea how you got into this? Okay. Well,、um, my dad is actually a German、uh, to English translator. He does mostly patents and other stuff.、Um, so you're and a so fan of Yeah. So I always, I always knew that that was a thing that I could do、um, because he would work at home. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You get to work at home and I don't have to be around people. That's awesome. So I was learning German、uh, for a while. That was actually my first second language. And I was also studying to be a ballet dancer. And things were getting pretty serious there. But then I fell in love with Sailor Moon. And I was suddenly like, oh my God, I love Japanese. I love anime. I went to Japan. I did all the touristy Japanese things and thought, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And so、um, luckily, I got injured my senior year of high school and was out of the running to be a ballet dancer.、Uh, so I was like, sweet, now I'm going to go be an exchange student and do the Japanese thing. And then、um, I was、uh, done in Kruger affected. Weeb. I thought that I knew more than I actually did, and I got into fan translating. And then, as luck would have it again,、um, one group that I was、uh, translating for fan subs happened to be Discotech Media before they became Discotech Media. And so I kind of fell ass backwards into it, I guess.、Um, nice. And yeah, that, that's that. <laughs> Excellent. Louise, why don't you tell us、uh, who you are and how you got into translation? Hi, I'm Louise Hill Kawai. I'm originally from Manchester in England. Um, I, well, it, it probably started when I took French and German at university and absolutely loved translating French into English.、Uh, but、um, then the real world came, coming,、uh, came calling and I decided I'd better get a job.、Um, so I went and I taught English in Japan. 
And um, I was teaching when um, and studying a little bit of Japanese um, once a week at a and taking the N. Oh God, I can't remember what it's called now. Which is the Japanese proficiency test. It's got a different name now because I'm old. And um, I realized that my Japanese wasn't going anywhere. All I was doing was studying these grammar points for this particular test. And I thought, you know, I need to give myself a boost. And um, I did a master's degree in Japanese at the University of Sheffield, which were, you could do distance learning while I was teaching in the in the daytime and um, studying in the evening. And um, yeah, I found that the thing I loved the most about that course was two things, the literature and the translation. And um, yeah, after I finished the course, I um, took a test with the uh, JLPP, a Japanese Literature Publishing Project, which had just started up. They were looking for translators. Apparently, I, the test was good and I got given work there and then it built up. Uh, you use work that I've done previously as examples to other places for oh I can do this and just gradually built up from there but I've always had a love of language literature and translation yeah <laughs> that's it um Mari why don't you give us an idea of how you got into it um so I I grew up in a Japanese household in New York City in the 70s and um back then they were actually showing um non-subscription uh anime on tv and uh, like i think it was weekly or it might have been daily in the summer vacation but on on public tv which is great um because that was still in the days of vhs and beta um and and not as easy to convince your relatives to send you packages but i did get I actually my first experience with manga was that I think my cousin sent me some uh, secondhand manga that they were done with. Um, and uh, then I, I went off to high school. My high school is actually enlightened enough to have an anime fan club. So I got to watch a little bit more contemporary anime there. And then I ended up at Cornell University. My first year, the esteemed um, Japanese anthropology professor retired. And I did manage to take his class, thankfully. But then um, even as a freshman, I they, I was honored to be let in on the professor search for the next, ja well, unfortunately Cornell only has a single Japanese anthropologist at a time if they do have one. Um, and so uh, they, um, I got to sit in on the quote unquote round table interviews with the potential candidates. The, the, there was only one candidate at the time, but there were a panel of students and faculty to, to listen. Um, the candidate I was really sad didn't end up at Cornell was Jennifer Robertson, who I think Erica and other Takarazuka fans would know as an anthropological scholar of Takarazuka, um, to which I clicked with immediately. Um, but uh, it turned out more, um, fortuitous that the actual person who then held the position for the next bunch of years was Ted Bester, who's best known for his anthropological survey of the Tsukiji fish market back when it was still in Tsukiji. And um, I went in and, you know, I said, look, I'm interested. I, I am Japanese, but I want to study my own culture from an anthropological viewpoint, specifically the interaction, and you'll love this sack, the interactions of animals and people in Japanese culture over time, specifically cats. Um, that was actually my undergrad um, dissertation thesis. And at the end of the interview, he said, so what do you think of manga and anime? And I said, uh, meanwhile, just for background, I had been told about several months earlier by a world-renowned Japanese religions professor also at Cornell that manga and anime were absolutely not academic subjects. This was in the early 90s before it was finally legitimized and, and that I should not even think about bringing it up. So when I got asked this by Ted, I, I was like, is this a trick question? Am I, is he trying to trap me? I said, well, you know, I grew up, you know, reading the stuff, consuming the stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I'm hoping to mention it because, of course, cats are a big part of manga and anime. Um, 
and he said oh well you see i have this graduate student back at columbia and they're you know about to leave for japan to do their phd dissertation research and they work in you know they do manga translation and they need help um would you be interested and i was like okay this has got to be a trick question now we're really into the trick question i said well um can i think about it can i get their information maybe suss it out I kid you not, that weekend I was downtown Ithaca at the com the one big comic book store. I literally ran into a one of those revolving carousel book um, comics stands. And what do I do but I knock off a bunch of Naushka comics off of that revolving carousel and went, that's the same name my professor gave it me. It was a sign. I was like, it this is this is God. It's not the most uncommon name, Thorn, you know. So I, I must, I'm, you know, there must be just a coincidence. But sure enough, same Thorn, um, and uh, that's kind of how I got my foot in the door at uh, Viz, which was my oh. first job. And Excellent. funny enough, the head editor at the time had been a Cornell grad herself. And within months, I literally got an email saying, do you have any classmates or friends at Cornell who might be interested too? So for a while, there was a whole stable of Cornell undergraduate Japanese foreign students or, or Japanese American students who worked for this. Funny. Well, thank you very much, Maureen. Pachi, pachi, pachi. Jennifer O'Donnell, why don't you tell us how you got into it? Uh, sure. Um... I'm Jennifer O'Donnell. I'm British, as you can probably tell from my accent, if it's still there. Um, I <laughs> started learning Japanese at around 17 because of a friend of mine and kind of kept it up as a hobby over the years, never really thinking it would go anywhere. I did anthropology at university with a year in Japan. And so I studied at Kansai Gaidai in Osaka. And then at the end of my degree, I was like, huh, what should I do? Anthropology is kind of not marketable unfortunately unless I want to go into academics uh, I wish it was <laughs> because it was so much fun um, so I was like okay I have my Japanese skills I'll use that um, but I didn't have any confidence at all in being well anything um, and so I thought I wouldn't be able to do translation and I didn't think I was good enough to be a translator so I was like okay I'm not going to do translation because it's that's way beyond me I'll just work at a company where I can use my Japanese and so I got a job at a an American company that makes systems diagnostics tools for their client in Japan. And then when I got to America, they were like, oh, by the way, we said we'd send you to Japan, but we haven't actually got an office in Japan yet. So can you set one up? <laughs> I guess they didn't actually think about it because that's a lot more difficult to do. And so after a year of not doing anything besides doing loads of research into how to open an office in Japan and finding out, hey, you actually need loads of you know, backing and loads of employees in Japan in order to do this, I was like, um, what do I do? And I got an email from uh, Yen Press saying, hey, we're looking for translators. Would you be interested in taking our test? And I did. And that's when I discovered, oh, okay, translation is something I could do. I failed the test horribly, by the way, because I'd never done translation before besides, you know, technical system diagnostics translations. And so I was like, well, maybe this is something I can do. So I decided to do a master's in translation, which didn't work out either <laughs> because the degree didn't actually teach me how to translate. It mostly taught me how to, you know, translation theory and um, how to be an academic in linguistics, even though I'm pretty sure 95% of the students taking it wanted to be translators. So it was disappointing. Um, and that's why afterwards I started Kind of teaching myself how to translate, writing a lot of articles and just putting out there, like, as I was learning, I was trying to release information to help other people learn how to do translation, because that's how I learned, is by <laughs> writing essays. It's just how the education in the UK is. Um, and so that's how kind of Gen Translation started, as both my business and these blogs being like, learning how to translate and helping other people learn how to translate. And then at the same time, I was just applying to loads of um, different companies. Uh, so I worked on manga, light novels, anime, but also like uh, websites, technical documents, just and anything and everything I did for a few years. 
Um, and then one thing led to another and I was lamenting how I'd never been to Japan. I think I'm one of those few people who never did JET or I was never an English teacher. And I was like, I wish one day I could get to Japan. And a friend of mine was like, oh, well, this game company, if you go to hiring, why don't you apply? I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get a job at a game company, especially not like that game company. Um, and I got the job. <laughs> and so two weeks later, I turned to my spouse and said, um, what do you think about moving to Japan? <laughs> and he was like, sure, that sounds great. Um, so yeah, we moved to Japan and I have now moved to a different game company and yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. And Sarah Lindsley. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Lindsley. I'm from Texas, but I live in New York right now. I actually got into manga when I was in college and I was pursuing a computer science degree. And I was, you know, I was in New York. I was like, I'm going to take any internship that I possibly can. And I saw that Kodansha Comics had an internship. So I was like, yeah, I used to read manga as a kid. Why not? It'll be fun. And then they hired me. And after the internship was over, they were like, you know how to use InDesign. Do you want to be a letterer? And I was like, sure, why not? And so I've been doing it ever since. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, for posterity, I'm Erica Friedman. And I am not a translator or a letterer, but I did become a publisher because I realized in 2003 that nobody was publishing Yuri Manga. So I just started to publish it myself. Um, so I was going to Japan and going to Call Me Cat and talking to the artists there. And I made a bunch of friends there and I kept going back. And so I was publishing earlier on and then publishing uh, kind of hit a wall in 2007 and eight with the, um, the, the big uh, depression that we had. So I'm, I do some freelance editing now for fun mostly, but uh, that is who I am. But all my free time is spent thinking and writing and talking about Yuri Manga and anime. Um, so thank you everyone for coming today. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and your stories are so interesting to me. Uh, Jennifer O'Donnell, you have said something that I think is the most important lesson. Don't self-censor. Be like, I can't get a job. Yeah, yeah, you actually could, right? I think that's such an important lesson. Okay. Yeah, it's one I've had to learn multiple times. <laughs> multiple times of, course, of course. So we have a bunch of questions and because there are seven of you, um, what I'd like you to do is if you want to answer, the, I'll ask the question. If you want to answer, just put up your hand, use the reaction button, and then I'll just call on you. I think that's why everybody gets a chance to talk. That's all right with everybody. So um, the first thing I want you all to do now is go over what was the topic of your presentation to the workshop for 2022? And what was the main point you were trying to get across to your to the attendees? So um, who would like to take that one first? Everybody jumps at the chance. I know. I'll call what, was, you what was the question again? Here, rephrase a little bit. I'm okay. sorry, I was I was chatting to Jen real quick because I haven't seen her since we used to have little meetups in Seattle and it was a lot of fun. So okay. So what was the topic? of your presentation to this year to the workshop attendees and what was the main point you were trying to get across to folks at part of the workshop? I was chatty, I'll go first. Um, my topic was translating special effects. Uh, I did it mainly because I think it's one of the, it's a unique part of translating comics as an art form, right? Everything obviously has its own thing, but comics, the language of comics, special effects, is one of the unique parts. It's what makes it's what makes comics comics and exists in no other medium on earth. So I think it's a fascinating part of translation. And I think the point that I was trying to get across really was just like with a lot of the stuff when I talk about translation, it's the understanding that translation is first and foremost an art form. It's not a science. It's not really a technical skill, um, and that you bring a lot of yourself to everything that you translate and. The more interesting that you are, the more interesting you can make your translation, the better it is for readers. And also just the understanding that your job as a translation is to try and basically be a bridge between whoever wrote the comic and whoever reads the comic, right? That's your job is to get these two to come together um, and just open up this whole great world of interesting stuff that's sort of locked behind this barrier of language. And as a translator, my job is to help remove that barrier and create more access to stuff that I personally think is wonderful and lovely and everyone should have access to it. Excellent. So that was mine. Excellent. Um, anybody else wanna jump in? I'll go next. Okay. My presentation was about manga lettering and first and foremost, I have to explain what that means. Um, 
because not many people know what letterers do. But the main point of my presentation was that lettering is not only an art, but good lettering is the intersection between the artist's intent, the reader's perspective, and the limitations of publishers and licensors. And they're right there in that sweet spot. That's good lettering. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and did you have uh, one message that you wanted everybody to take away from your workshop? Um, that lettering is subjective and very hard. Excellent. Anybody else? I can go next. Excellent, Jennifer. Um, so I did the pitfalls in translation. I can't remember the exact title. Persistent pitfalls in media translation. Um, and it was sort of about, as I mentioned, kind of don't, don't do what I did, kids. Um, because I think a lot of aspiring translators tend to stick very close to the Japanese, kind of being afraid to step out. And so I really wanted people to realize that um, sort of you can, you don't have to stick one for one for the wording of the original Japanese. You can express the same meaning and the same information and actually being too close can, kind, can sometimes introduce mistranslations. And so you should think about sort of how the English reflects the original meaning. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Cool, excellent. And next, anybody? I can call you out, Louise. What was your? Oh, sorry, Sarah. You wanna you wanna go next, Sarah? Sure, why not? Um, so um, my my week. jumping off point, I guess, was just um, all the stuff about translation that kind of has nothing to do with translation, like uh, money and scheduling and rates and um, stuff like that. And then also kind of piggybacking um, off of what Jen was saying, um, just bringing that human side, I guess, to translating. Um, you are a human, you are a person, you have to eat, you have to live, but also um, it's your job to interpret everything. And that that's, I don't know, it's not a very brainy thing. It's sometimes something you have to do with your heart. Um, so yeah, that was the main thing I wanted to get across in the presentation was that a lot of this job, what we do, you can't really learn in a classroom or it isn't at the moment. It doesn't seem to be taught in a classroom from what I'm hearing from everybody else. I mean, I didn't learn any of this in a classroom. We all kind of had to find our own way. Um, so I just wanted everyone to uh, see that connection of how personal and how human it is. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So Louise, why don't we go back to you now? Yes, uh, my presentation was about what I actually do as a literary translator, um, just giving people a sample of the uh, different kind, different aspects of the job. Um, and then the workshop part of my translate, uh, part of my translate, part of my presentation was on the topic of how do we deal with Japanese words and concepts that are unfamiliar to a Western audience, uh, Western readership. Um, how are you going to deal with words and I that that they've never seen before about in and the example I took was from um, the Honjin murders, which is an old book from uh, written in 1946 with um, a very important scene where um, uh, architecture is really important traditional of a traditional Japanese house and we've no pictures in literature everything has to be imagined and so how are you going to use language to um give people the the, the exact image of what they're looking at especially uh, especially as this was a locked room murder mystery and lot the mechanics of a locked room murder i can't say that word. the mechanics of a locked room murder mystery are very very important to solving the plot you can't have people saying well i couldn't imagine it because you know she hadn't written or you know the author the translator hadn't written it properly so i was just giving people some different options of how to uh how to deal with that and um, it was fun because I'd already watched some of the people who, who'd been uh, presenting on manga and how different it was to, uh, to manga, how in manga you have to keep things short and brief and, sim and simple to fit into those, those speech bubbles and, and very visual for the letterers um, and all that. It was so different to, to literature where you actually have a little bit of leeway and you can um, expand a little bit <laughs> with your explanations. So um, yeah, that was my presentation. Excellent. Excellent. And Mari, what, uh, what was your presentation about and what do you, message would you like to get across to the, the attendees? 
Um, so I was the other half of the first workshop um, alongside Zach. And um, since he was talking about sound effects, I decided to um, focus on kind of word plays of different sorts, including phonetic um, phononyms. Um, since it was, it's not sound effects, but it still has to do with sounds. And um, one of the things I want to reiterate, which um, people, those who have studied written Japanese may have already learned or picked up on is that the names of characters are, um, can be as significant in the way that they're written in, in kanji and kana as the, you know, and, and a lot of times you unfortunately lose that in localization, um, but even in um, transliteration, because of course, English is not a pictorial language. Um, and in addition, that in and of itself was also kind of a tongue in cheek phononym because name in uh, manga process terminology is means uh, or signifies a rough draft of a manga, which I provided examples were. Um, I didn't quite get to it because of the lack of time, um, but I had wanted to, I often talk about dialects and um, speech mannerisms, as well as um, slang. And I did talk a little bit about terms that um, seem to mean one thing, but they, they, their origin might be something else or they might mean something else. And not just necessarily between Japanese and English, but also um, other languages and English. And um, finally, um, I also talked about how names in, and terms in English, even within English, can be tricky because you've got British English versus American English. And then if characters are European, do you use their American English uh, spelling or do you use the original European languages spelling? Cool. Thank you very much. And Jennifer Sherman. Hey, I, I, before I talk about what my presentation was, I need to specify that I am an editor, not a translator. I'm an editor of light novels and manga for Viz Media. And I do translation tasks every day, but I'm not actually a translator. Um, so part of my presentation was to explain what I do because an in-house editor is um, more of a project manager. So like half or a, a very large chunk of what I do is not actually editing proper. Um, and I wanted to let freelancers especially know a lot of the different parts of the production process for manga and light novels, because I think most freelancers don't necessarily get a good grasp of that. Um, and I miss that as a freelancer. Um, and I also wanted to point out that in translation, in any like localized media, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more things to consider than just the words on the page for the translation too, of course. It can be a consideration with the company or the licensor itself, or it can be a consideration of the space on the page of a manga. Um, and there's so many different things you have to consider all the time when you're working on translations. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we have a bunch of questions from some of the uh, attendees, some of the um, leaders here. So uh, from Jennifer O'Donnell, uh, she would like to know what you all think uh, about what changes do you see coming in our industry and what changes do you think there might be in the near future or far future, I guess. So um, I, think was, I think I wrote that. Not the other Jennifer. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that Jennifer Sherman? I apologize. <laughs> My apologies, Jennifer. So that was from Jennifer Sherman, the, that question. Um, so I wondered if any of you have any thoughts about what changes, and I'm going to actually um, widen that a bit. What changes do you think you've seen in your time in the industry? And what changes do you think you might see in the future? Do, does anybody want to address that? Uh, 
<laughs> well, first, uh, when I started, it was like almost 20 years ago. So one of the biggest changes I've seen is just like there's it, it, anime, manga, light novels. It's all so much more ubiquitous. It went from being this super niche underground hobby and, you know, where things like fan translations were a lot more the norm to now you have all these places where as a fan, you can get this content for free. Like that's made things better in some ways, but it's also been a bit of a curse in other ways. I feel like there's, right now, I feel like we're kind of at a crossroads almost where we could go one way or we could go another way. We could go the way of um, using technology and all of this um, ubiquitousness of, of our medium to send um, our translations far and wide, employ more people, um, get more work out there and get it out there better, or they could all consolidate, the suits could call all the shots, and we could see more and more layoffs, lower and lower wages, and less, less quality. And machine translation also is this looming threat that a few years ago, when it was first on my horizon, I was kind of like, hmm, machine translation, should we be worried about that? Everyone was like, ah, nah, machine translate, it's never going to happen. But I'm already seeing it um, start to creep in. Companies are trying to cut corners. Some of these newer companies some of these overseas companies are trying to cut corners and trying to use machine translators and some of the fans are falling for it and um, that's kind of where I'm at right now I'm kind of optimistic but also worried at the same time about where it's going okay anybody else have any thoughts yeah I do oh, so you have Rodong? oh yeah um actually I was actually going to say almost exactly the same thing as Sarah um so I'll back that up as yes I'm also concerned that the industry can easily go in a very bad direction, especially with the whole crunchy road, crunchy roll Funimation merger, and then getting rid of all of the, you know, translators who are actually paid a reasonable wage. So they only have their $90 episode <laughs> translators left. Um, so that sucks. But on the flip side, at least from video games, um, because I'm involved in the video game localization, it's kind of the community is getting a revamp and um, there's the International Game Developers Association where localizers from all over the world in all kinds of languages are kind of getting together and we're working on like local like game localization best practices and about educating game developers about localization and so that side of media translation is I think at least getting better as people are putting out more stuff to educate people who are not translators and I guess it's kind of the same with anime and manga as well as people are trying harder to educate you know regular people about what we do and and how important it is to have good translations out there mm -hmm. excellent um, anybody see any sign of union unionization in translators sarah we're I, we're all freelancers so i don't think that you literally legally can have a union of freelancers as far as i understand there is a freelancer union in new oh, york is there? Okay. state yeah. there it is it is all freelancers uh, there are a bunch of us old timers that used to sit around mm -hmm. the table and joke about unionizing i mm -hmm. kid you not mm -hmm. it never yeah. it never bore fruit um but but you know it's not like it's never been brought up Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but we were we were even more afraid. Even though this was before the uh, the real big floodgates of of fan translators, but we were still afraid that they'll just go somewhere else and find other people to to hire. If right. we did. Oh yeah, we're also completely replaceable, and I've seen that as a trend too. Like that's one of the interesting things that a trend has been. Um, and it's a trend some of us, myself, have been fighting against is the making the translator more and more invisible because the less prominent art you are, the more replaceable you are. If you look at manga from the 90s, when manga first started coming on, people actually got, translators got cover credit, you know, um, Rachel Thorne, cover credit, you know, right up there, person written and person translated by. And um, that gave them power because then they had followers and they had fans and they weren't immediately replaceable. And it's become more and more that now you um, you have translators working on great games who sign NDAs. They're not even allowed to talk about the fact that they worked on the game. Who does that benefit? It benefits only the company because it makes the translators immediately replaceable. Um, 
I also want to add one other thing. I thought what Sarah said is that I think that we shouldn't discount the future of machine learning. I think it's entirely possible. I've seen how Google Translate has leapt and just become so much better than it ever used to be. I honestly think that there will be a future where machine learning completely, machine translating completely takes over. I could easily foresee that. I think that it's not going to happen now. I think that it will happen like 30, 40 years, maybe. Um, I'm old, I'll be dead by then. So that's your guys' problem. But um, I also, I mean, just think about that stuff. Like computer used to not be a device. Computer was an occupation, a job that a human did. You were a computer for a living and that's what you did as your job title. Does anyone even think of that as anything more than a machine anymore? No, of course not. So I, I could easily see a future where 30 to 40 years from now, 50 years from now, there's no such thing as translator as a job anymore. It's just, it's a button you click on a computer because I think that it's possible. Um, yeah. Yeah, Mari, you have something you want to say? Um, I have to say, uh, um, as someone who started in the mid '90s, one of the changes that I, I, one of the biggest changes that I don't like, although I know there are there are even fans out there trying to um, help make this better, is social media. For all the benefits of social media, it's also led to a lot more anonymity and posting negativity and hate. And um, and it and really disturbs me. Look, if you have a different opinion, I, I, I try what I try to tell people is I'm not I, I love hearing differing opinions, even opposing opinions, but don't turn it into something negative about someone's person or someone's professional integrity. Right. In fact, that was part of what my presentation was about was, you know, there's there's definitely the positive side of social media is you get to communicate with other people that like we've all communicated with each other, which are like the folks on the Discord communicating with, with each other. But on the opposite side, it does mean that the lowest common denominator does feel free to suddenly become experts and tell you how you got it wrong. And the trick is simply to make sure your boundaries stay strong and you know who you're going to pay attention to and who you're not going to pay attention to. Um, or in my case, as Eric often chides me, is stay off social media right. pretty much entirely. <laughs> right. Now, in the chat, we're getting a couple of comments that I want to say. This is something that's been happening a lot. There's a lot more hashtags named the translator. Translators on the cover. I know there was a big thing last summer about giving letterers credit. And by and large, I'm starting to see those have ripples. Because when, as a reviewer, I'm seeing more and more of the people who are involved in the work of a book getting credited. There was a time when I'd open up a manga and it was the translator. And as far as I was concerned, nobody else works on that book. But of course, I know in publishing, there was like a dozen people who work on the book. So we still have a lot of ways to go. As far as I know, Seven Seas is the only company still that literally credits every single person. And I have to say, I pushed them for that way back in the day because there's not just the translators and adapters and letters and editors and colorists and the cover people and on and on and on. So um, I think those things are helping a little bit. Um, and uh, Jessica just wants us to know that uh, tomorrow is Comics Day and she has a link in the chat for people who want to celebrate Comics Day. Um, and Seven Seas, uh, Jennifer Dunn points out, does credit people on their website as well, which again, as a reviewer, boy, I wish they would all do that. If you have a website for the book, please put the credits there. It would just make reviewers' lives so much easier. Thank you very much. Erica, um, it's funny that you brought the part of what you did up because I was going to also piggyback on or respond to Zach where when I started at Viz, the adapter got their name on the cover. So I think the reason why Rachel got credit was because she was adapting as well as translating. Mm -hmm. Translator never got front cover treatment. Um, and in fact, this, look, it might have changed. I, I don't have an old copy of anything handy right now, but this was pretty good at naming letters and adapters, but I was always angry because the adapter had top billing and I was second under the adapter. And I'm like, the adapter wouldn't have a job without what I did. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to throw in there also um, that there, I mean, of all the companies that I work for, um, they, they, 
almost all name the entire staff. So one that I like the best is Dark Horse because Dark Horse puts it right on the front piece. Um, mm -hmm. So it'll be, you know, by manga artist and then the next page will have translator, letterer, yeah. editor. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Biz too. Uh, yeah, but Ian stuff. doesn't. And mm -hmm. yeah, as a, no. as a reviewer, it drives me crazy. Totally, um, it's, it's the worst. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I well, the editors rarely get credit, mm -hmm. and the you know all of the the proofreaders and that kind of thing. All right, so um, I wanted to ask you all, uh, what was your best takeaway from the workshop? Because some of you have commented later on that you learned some stuff. So I want to know what you learned. What was your takeaway from the workshop? And did you get learn anything or did you get a useful tip? Yes, Mari. Actually, oh, sorry. Could oh, sorry, I, no, go ahead, I, I still had something I wanted to say on the previous topic. Oh, certainly, of course. Um, uh, in the literature world, in the world of literature, I wanted to say that, um, uh, Sorry, I just noticed. Oh, sorry. Uh, in the literature world, I wanted to say um, things are looking up a little bit. I wanted to add something that made, made gave people a little bit of um, a little, something a little more optimistic. Um, in the world of literature, um, I don't exactly have a union, but uh, I'm a member of a society of translators in the UK, and um, they have some. Uh, have um, lawyers working for them who will look at your contract that you've made with a company and vet it and and tell you what they think is wrong with it and what and how you and advise you to possibly uh, ask for some uh, different conditions nice. and that's really very useful um i uh they also have a suggested they can't make it legal but it's a suggested amount per word that a translator should be getting and so uh you can always i always write when i'm talking to the publisher oh by the way the society of translators suggests this i think i should get at least this or if i'm feeling more savvy than that i ask for more than that and then say <laughs> yeah but this is the this is the amount that the uh, society of translators suggests so um there are things you can do also the the good news in in uh literature is that more people are buying translations um okay the market is not huge uh, the market is a lot lower than the market for uh manga how you look as I, I looked into it but it is increasing and so uh there is more work Excellent. and um yeah uh things things are not too bad and then the translator on the cover um issue uh yeah that's not working out very well some companies will put the translator's name on the cover already uh many won't and they just say oh it's our policy not to and i ask every single time could i please have my name on the cover i don't care i know even ones i've worked for before who wait who tell me it's their policy not to i still ask every single time please can i have my name on the cover and um read to put translators' names on the cover. It was nice. big news. They were the first, com first company to agree. So I've already got a book out, um, The Cat Who Saved Books, with them, but the second printing is coming out. So I wrote to them, yay, I'm so excited. Please put my name on the cover. And they wrote back, I'm sorry, this was supposed to be very positive. It's gone a little negative. They wrote back and said, um, yeah, about that. We had this meeting and we decided that on the cover can mean on the back cover or on the inside flap nice. of the cover and you are already on the inside flap inside back flap i must add of the cover but wow. when we put out the paperback edition which is coming out soon you will be on the back cover oh come on it's, <laughs> it's so <laughs> niggly right it's so it's oh, so petty. i know and um I, I got I, I had this question many times, so I'll just pre-answer it because I know it's coming. Why don't companies want to put the translator's name on the cover? Why are they doing this? And it comes from a long idea that um, the public think that translations are difficult uh. and that they will be too hard to understand if it's translated from another language. So they kind of like to try to hide that right. by putting um, you know, the Katusei book Sosuke Natsukawa, it 
all this seems like it was already written in English and therefore it won't be too difficult for them mm -hmm. to read. Um, mm -hmm. In in that that's the that's the reason for in literature. I don't know what the reason is. If the reason is the same uh, in in other fields, but anyway, um, I just thought I'd throw that out. Sorry, it ended on negative note, but there no, is a you positive know what, note. I have to say, when I was in the corporate world, it was very similar. I was doing a lot of research, and you'd hand it off to the marketing people, and they'd take your name off of it and put their name on it. It's absolutely something that happens all the time, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with. Um, just, you know, who gets the credit and, who, and again, what Zach said, how replaceable people are, but also this idea that translations should be transparent. They don't exist, you know, and so we should all just pick up a book and be magically reading it. Um, mm. So there's that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, oh, no. sorry, and just one quick thing, though, in literature translation, mm. we do buy in our contracts, always <laughs> get our name somewhere. Mm -hmm. So our name is on the title page. So you do have to open the book and flick through a little bit, but you do get translation by Louise Hilkawai, copyright, sorry, copyright, translation copyright Louise Hilkawai mm -hmm. and the year that it was done. So at least your name is in there if someone tries to look for you. you <laughs> okay, know, sorry, that's Louise, all. Thank you. No, I, that was great. I was just going to build on that because I thought that was what you said was so interesting. I once asked an, an editor about the continually burying of manga of tra manga translators credits and they were said mainly because fans didn't like to feel that there was a barrier between them and reading the original person's mm -hmm. work right and so when you saw a translator's name up bold in front it was like hey this guy's doing it not that guy this guy not then so they started to actually kind of like reject that and then they when there's no translator listed they get to emotionally feel that they are connecting with the artist or that was the theory behind it at any rate. Mari, you had something you want to add? Uh, well, that and answer your actual next question too. Oh, okay, we'll mm -hmm. do that in a second. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually think I want to say I think that the issue of invisibly the translator is coming around full circle. A lot of fans, a lot of people in the industry are pushing for more and more uh, credit. And I think that's one of the best trends that I'm seeing. And the fact that Sarah has led uh, a huge push to um, tr to credit letterers, I think, was a really big key. And Sarah, you have something you want to say? Uh, I, I actually had something I wanted to say, Erica. Sorry, Mari. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I've experienced the opposite where I've had a, at least one publisher um, hire me or uh, request that I work on something because of who I was. Mm. I mean, granted, it's the titles I've worked on too, but they want to be able to say, you know, translator of Naruto and Inuyasha worked on this title, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so it, it, you know, it, 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 I think I, I can see where some publishers might think the way that they did or they do, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, one of the effective ways of bargaining too is saying like, Hey, you can actually potentially sell more mm -hmm. by using certain translator. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I'm sorry, Sarah, you had a, a thing you wanted to say. Um, in the same way that giving credit to translators and letters will keep people in the industry and also like show that this is a high quality translation, it also does the opposite for consumers. I mean, you're seeing this lately where manga is being credited for certain companies, certain people, certain agencies, and they won't buy it because they know it's going to be low quality. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about the direction that the industry is headed, you're going to see much more digital first releases that are probably done for very little money which like most consumers are fine with because they're only paying like a dollar for it but if they're buying something in print and they see that it's still done by these like terrible people like these terrible localizations they might not buy it so right. I mean that's another reason why credits are so important yeah and uh years ago somebody had pointed out that if you are working on something and you're not credited. You can't, you put it on your CV, but how do you prove it? Because there's that, Yeah. you know? <clears throat> All right, then moving on to the question was, um, what was your best takeaway from the workshop? And uh, did you learn anything or you had a useful tip? Does anybody want to talk about that? Oh, go ahead, Sarah. 
No, I didn't. Your hand is really far. I'll, I'll go. Oh. <laughs> okay, Sarah Moon, go for it. Um, yeah, so um, I, I have a little anecdote uh, that, that is related to what I'm about to say, but um, I did improv comedy with comedy sports for 10 years, and um, I was an improviser. We do, like, we make up scenes as we go along without a script. It's, it's a lot of fun, actually. It's like playing D&D, &D, but, like, on stage, kind of like LARPing. Anyway, um, we were often told by our instructors, uh, we were always encouraged to be the referee of the show, the person that like calls all the shots on all of the games, the one who gets the suggestions from the audience, the one who runs the entire show. And a lot of us were really hesitant to be the referee because like, we're like, oh, that's, that's not acting or improvising. I don't want to be the referee, but it's true. When, when I started refereeing, I became such a better improviser as a result. And that's kind of what I got from this workshop especially Sarah's and um, Jen Sherman's presentations, it's really, really useful as a translator, like hearing what people in the other roles uh, need from me. Um, like I'll get feedback sometimes from my editors and project managers and that's always useful, but it's really, it was really enlightening hearing directly from letterers or editors, like the kinds of things that they deal with and the kinds of things that they want from translators. Um, I, I would learn a lot also, I think, if I were a letterer or if I were an editor, but um, this is a lot faster <laughs> just hearing presentations from them. Uh, that's what I uh, got most out of this, I think, is like, you know, learning what other people need from me. Excellent. Excellent. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? I know that I learned a lot from Jennifer Sherman's um, presentation because I really like the fact that, you, you know, Jennifer, you talked about uh, what you're worth it's so important you know how to know what you're worth and how to ask for what you're worth and and all of you really kind of made that point but i felt like actually saying here's the amount of money that people should be asking for was just really helpful you know um mari you have something um i have to say i knew a little bit about lettering but finding out about fonts being licensed was absolutely blew me away because it was some it, it, I mean it makes sense but I never even thought about it um because you know part of I mean it's partly a joke partly serious but I've always been like damn I could probably double my paycheck or even triple it if I if I learned to letter too but you know, I, I would not even have thought about needing to like use certain you know I was just going to use whatever font I chose on Photoshop without thinking about whether the publisher would have a license or would need a license for it and also, um, in, in addition to just the topics and the speakers, I mean, just getting to know the speakers, I'm definitely going to hit up Louise um, at some point in the future, because even though I don't do literary translations, I do translate prose. And um, so I was kind of fascinated about learning more about the process in terms of that. Excellent. Excellent. Jennifer O'Donnell. Whoops. Yep. Uh, ooh, um, sorry, I keep trying to lower hand and I'm mute at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of the things that always amazes me, and this workshop definitely highlighted that, is how intersectional translation, especially the industry, is. Because, um, as Mari said, Louise's presentation was a really great look at sort of how you can expound upon Japanese terms and how that skill can be used in other places. And the same with, as Sarah said, knowing what letterers need from translators and what editors need from translators and what every, like, cause it's all interconnected. And even though you might only be interested in manga, learning the skills for game or anime or literary translation, it all, it all kind of connects together. It's all useful. Great, yeah. excellent. And Jennifer Sherman? I, I always think it's really interesting to hear from people who work with different companies, especially like freelancers who work with, you know, however many different companies. Um, Cause I used to be a freelancer. And so I got kind of a glimpse of, you know, different companies policies, but now I work in house. So I only know what my own company does. And I sort of, you know, not forget, but it's, it's, it's important to remind yourself in this industry that each company has different ways they do things too. And maybe some are better, maybe some are worse than what your own company does. And 
I don't know, one, one example I remember from the workshop was maybe it was, I think it was Sarah Lindsley who mentions that, yeah, sometimes letters might get an unedited manga script to letter, for example. And I just, I can't fathom doing that personally where I'm, where I'm at right now. Um, but yeah, it's just fascinating to learn what people who work with different people have to face, I guess. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yes, Zach. So the thing I learned, I don't know, I just thought it was really fun seeing all of these folks as well, which is really great because I've almost everyone here I know online in some way or the other. And so it's just fascinating to get to see the actual human beings. And, um, and that's such an important part of the translation industry is that we are human beings. And so this was just a great opportunity to, um, to come together and actually talk with everyone. So that was actually my favorite part has been just chatting with everyone. It's been so much fun. And whether here or on the Discord or something right. like this, you know, that community has been great. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. Um, so Jennifer Sherman had another uh, good question that I wanted to uh, ask you all. Uh, with many jobs in fun or entertainment industries, especially those involving work from home, there could be pitfalls with your work-life balance and setting boundaries. What are your techniques for maintaining good work-life balance and not going out of your comfort zone in ways you wouldn't for other types of jobs? So basically, how are you keeping work-life balance? How are you making sure it doesn't encroach on everything? Or are we all working 24-7? Yeah, I, I, just, I just don't. I mean, you know, it's, it's a nice theory. It's great to throw out there and all that fun stuff, but, but I, I just don't, you know. Um, I told myself I would cut back on, on taking on too much work and just yesterday I got an offer for three manga to translate simultaneously I said yes to them all I mean you know I, if I'm honest so yeah uh, yeah else? sometimes sometimes I have to just force myself um to take a day off um <laughs> I actually there's a twitter account I follow called the nap ministry and they're they're actually kind of helpful they they like constantly tweet about reminding you rest take a nap and it's it's actually very nice and very empowering um, but yeah, I have to actually schedule like days off and like sometimes force myself to take a day off. Remind yourself that like if you don't take a day off, like your body will force you to take a day off at some point or your brain Usually will force more you. than one day. If you yeah, or, off, right? or you'll just like have like five horrible work days in a row and you're like, why am I not so unproductive at work? <laughs> it's like, well, because you haven't taken a day off. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree with Zach. I, I don't have a work-life balance. Uh, I work everywhere. I'm on a walk. I'm thinking about work. I'm lying in bed at night. I think about work. Um, I work on my couch where I am right now. Um, but yeah, you just you just have to force yourself sometimes to take take a nap, take a break. Anybody else? Louise, do you have any thoughts? Sorry, keep forgetting to unmute. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, terrible. Uh, I used to be really good at work-life balance when I wasn't so well known and didn't have that much work. But since uh, my name became a bit better known, I keep being offered a lot more work. And guess what? I hardly ever say no. And so I got myself into, I'll be this is a big warning to everybody. I got myself in quite a bad situation 2020, 2021, because uh, the pandemic uh, caused a lot of changes in, um, in so many people's working lives and a lot of people lost work. However, reading did not diminish during pandemic. Actually went up. People it went wanted up to lot. read. And I'm sure this yeah. is the same the case with, with many people sitting at the sitting here right now. And um, there was also so much big increase in online translation, um, things like this, um, presentations, all kinds of things. Um, I uh, there was even um, uh, there was even a, a little thing I took part in where uh, Japanese authors were writing flash fiction on the topic of the pandemic, and there was one every day from a new author to translate, and I was one of the practically volunteer translators on that one because the pay was I won't even tell you was <laughs> shocking and um I just said yes to everything but I also had three novels that I'd signed contracts to translate and I kept putting those off thinking well I've got time I've got time I've got time here I am now 
absolutely panicked working ridiculous hours to try to get the third of those three novels done and um it's not good for my health it's not great please my my um <laughs> my recommendation is don't get overexcited don't accept everything or even try to negotiate could you possibly um hold off a bit sometimes they will say yes it doesn't matter yeah we don't mind if you if you do it later sometimes they'll say no i'm sorry i need it now i'll go with a different translator learn to be able to say never mind i didn't get that job something else will come along <laughs> and just get on with the job that you're supposed to be doing because yeah i've got myself in a terrible situation uh working too many hours and it's not good for anybody i'm sh sounds like everyone's the same but yeah, yeah i actually have friends yeah. in mainstream publishing and book publishing and they have exactly the same situation and for them everything is cyclical right so comes you know the period of time when all of the to be sold at christmas books come out and they don't breathe for like three months like sleeping is a thing they do real quick in between projects and it's it's not great for everybody and you do have to kind of balance all that sarah you have some thoughts one thing that i've learned is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and um if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably heard me talk about all the scripts that I use. And some of these scripts that I wrote in a couple hours have saved me literally thousands of hours of work. So it doesn't have to be scripts. It can be something, just a repeatable process, something that might take a little bit of time right now to figure out and automate in some way, whatever that means for your workflow. But down the line, it will save you a ton of, a ton of time and also it'll like bump up your hourly wage, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, Mari, do you have any thoughts on this? You've been working for a long time now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting because I might literally have the least amount of work right now, subjectively. Um, when I started, it was, I, I wasn't getting a lot of titles for a while because I was starting out and I was in college. Um, but as Zach brought up about the all-nighters, it was also easier to pull all-nighters. I mean, now I don't do them, not because I don't do them or choose not to do them because my body simply will give out. Um, but I've also um, tried not to need to do them, um, <laughs> but not having as much work helps. Um, but what I put just put in the chat too is that, uh, you know, I, I still have Boruto, which is monthly. And in between, I've been doing some um, video related translation or translating from videos. And, um, and then I've also done live con uh, consecutive interpreting on Zoom and just doing kind of those switch arounds really helps because even though they're all work they're in um they require different um a little bit of different skill set the really different skill set too is when i was i was just trying to write in the chat but i'm too slow is um back when i was working more as a vet too you know that's how i would really break things out is i would work in a clinic one or two days a week. And then I would translate, you know, about three days a week and try to take two days off. Um, and, you know, it was interesting. It, it, and it was also fascinating because everyone in the vet, my vet colleagues were fascinated by the manga translation, but of course thought I was making mounds and mounds of money. And my manga colleagues or fans would be fascinated by the fact that I was a vet which is fascinating. Being a vet is fascinating, but they also thought I was making mounts and mounts of money, which is unfortunately also a big falsehood. So I was like, I'm just barely eating out of the living doing both <laughs> right now. So, um, or right now, meaning when I was talking to them, I, I'm making even less because I'm not working much as a vet. But um, yeah, I mean, to, to Louise's point, COVID was definitely a big wake up call in some ways too, because at the point that the pandemic started, my biggest income, even though it was more sporadic, were anime conventions. Um, I was mainly in the employ of Sunrise to be their exclusive interpreter and essentially, um, oh, what's that term, handler for their creators 
when they were invited to East Coast um, and some outside East Coast cons. Um, and so I would be literally be with them for a week plus and um, it was exhausting. That, that can become exhausting because even though a lot of cons provided escort interpreters, I would still need to be with the guests to make sure nothing untoward happened or they or in reverse they didn't ask too much of the conventions interpreters um so it was almost a 20 hour day job um but i got paid handsomely and i got to travel um and i got to know a lot of behind the scenes stuff that if i ever wrote a memoir as they say um <laughs> but uh yeah so then the pandemic hit and everything came to a screeching halt and a lot of fan conventions even and a lot of commercial ones still don't have Japanese guests even virtually. Yeah, that's right. A few do. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have a question for everybody and, and you can answer as you like. Uh, what are your, either when you were beginning or now, what's a go-to resource for you, a website or uh, a book or something that you really found that was just incredibly useful for you to lean on when you needed uh, assistance. Of course, we all have like Twitter and the Discord now, so we're all talking sort of in real time, but did you have an old school uh, resource or tool that you like to lean on? I'm, I'm gonna give the most horrible answer that is of no use to everyone, so, Absolutely. but it's also true. My wife, uh, yeah, I highly recommend marrying a native Japanese speaker that you can instantly go to for advice at any time. It's great. It's awesome. It's the best. Hey, honey, what does this mean? There That's it good. is. We'll, we'll do that. Yes, Louise. I married a Japanese man who refuses to help me with anything. <laughs> so don't necessarily assume that marrying a Japanese so the, person so the will rule help. Here is Jap okay, <laughs> we got that. Yeah. Any other? Um, so Jennifer Hodala, you have your hand. Yeah, when I started freelancing, because um, I said I had to teach myself um, how to succeed as a freelance translation by Corinne McKay. She is uh, crumbs. I think she's a French translator. Um, but even though she works in a completely different field, her advice, I think, has been very useful. And also more recently, even though I don't do freelance, I still like to keep tabs on, you know, <laughs> I like to keep tabs on everything. Um, and so the podcast Smart Habits for Translators is a fantastic podcast about healthy work life clarity. They call it um, understanding when you need to prioritize family, when you need to prioritize job work and stuff like that. And so they're really good about healthy freelancing and being successful and not burning yourself out. Excellent. Yeah. Anybody else? Any good thoughts? Yes, Louise. Um, I think in being a freelancer, as most people here are, can be very, very um, lonely. And you really, when I started out, I didn't know what was going on in the rest of the industry anywhere. I didn't know anything. I was even living in Fort Worth, Texas, which, you know, my goodness, I mean, the ends of the earth. So um, <laughs> just temporarily. <laughs> and um, yeah, find making contacts with anybody in the industry who's willing to talk to you and give you advice is, um, is very important. And I now have a little collaboration with three other literary translators uh, we used to pre-pandemic meet once a month um, in person and bring a little sample of what we're working on and, and read it together and get people's opinion on, on you know, things like basic things like word choice and how it felt and, and, and voice and all kinds of things like that. Um, since the pandemic started, things got a little crazy um, and we sometimes meet but we uh, on Zoom, but we do sometimes get together on Zoom and do the same thing and share a bit of work. And that's been absolutely wonderful because before then I felt very alone and uh, now I don't. So uh, also if, if possible, when events get going again in person, attend as many events as you possibly can, attend workshops, do things like, um, do anything you can to connect. And um, it's also good. I did a lot of workshops that were being offered um, uh, by experts in the, in the uh, field. And I made lots of connections that way and um, also learned a lot that way. So uh, 
take part in as much as you can and try to to make friends in the industry. Of course, there are people who will not be friendly. There are people who consider you um, a rival. There's always that always happens. But most of the time, people are very open to um, connecting and helping and giving advice. And uh, that's been so important for me. Excellent. Excellent. Sarah, you have you have your hand up? Yeah, I totally agree. Community has been the single most important factor in making me a better letterer. We, I mean, the lettering community itself is so supportive and so welcoming, especially to newbies. So if you have no experience lettering and you just want to like try it, get in contact with other letterers. We're, there are a lot of amazing people. It's great to be able to like talk to somebody who has your extremely niche problems and compare your processes and like, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely seek out your community. I would agree with that a thousand percent. Also, all of the folks, or almost all of the folks here on this, uh, this round table, you guys have amazing sites, Sarah and Jennifer and uh, Sarah Moon does great videos. Um, you know, all of you, do stuff online you're all out there you're talking mari you're at events um all of those places are places that you can get information so uh if you want to know about good lettering practices sarah lindsley has a guide if you want to know about good translation things sarah moon has videos if you want to know about places you can go to do practicing translations jennifer o'donnell has a great website with blogs and links and also we have a Discord for the workshop and I will invite you all. I just put the link into the uh, chat, but I will also make sure it goes on the show notes if this goes up on YouTube. Um, our workshop is full of these people and other people in the business. We have folks like Jen Cash and others who are hanging out and putting links. And I have to say that I feel for, for, for the money of free, uh, the translation lettering manga anime um, business is full of some of the most incredibly generous people with their time and their expertise and I can't I know that particularly back in the day you there was a lot of folks who were like oh these are my rivals but right now everyone's like look we're in a boat and the boat has got holes and it's not even about bailing we're also trying to you know build sales and so those so let's do this right now on a deadline and everyone is really good about sharing their information and um, giving you ideas and giving you links. So that's really, really great. And some of the links are going right into the chat right now. So please pay attention to those. It's all some really, really great stuff. Um, so I would, I would absolutely agree that community is your absolute number one resource. It's one of the best resources. Just okay. be, I was going to say, be warned that if you get to know me too, well enough, I will put you on a panel at a convention. It's just something that will happen. I've done it to several people here. So, you know, just, just be warned. True. It's true. Um, and not that he will actually warn you. He will just say, yeah. oh, hey, you're here. You want to be on a panel? Yeah. And then Come you have panel. to be on a panel in 10 minutes. So that happens. Yeah, I do. I do think conventions, like Marty said, um, conventions are one of, uh, anime conventions, one of the best way that you can network. Um, especially if they're large conventions that publishers go to um, and get to know the editors because the editors are the people who do all the hiring. So mm -hmm. when you do get to know people, um, it's not enough to get to know with your own spe like speciality, like fellow translators, you know, try and broaden your community, get to know letterers, get to know editors, get to know everyone in the whole community. And uh, you're at a convention and you're at a booth and it's something mm -hmm. that's a relatively local company. Talk to the folks back there behind the booth because almost I would say most of the time, they're people working at the company. They're not hired hands that come in and they're not booth babes. You could usually tell they're not booth babes and you should talk to them and ask them about the company and ask them how they got into it and you know what they suggest. And generally people, I'm telling you, people are really very generous with their time and effort. Um, um, Jack, I just wanted to not take credit. Luis was the one who was mentioning conventions. Oh, okay. At least tonight. Um, I, I only mentioned that I worked them tonight. You worked them. Yep. Correct. Yep. But, but they are really important. And, you know, I think there's a feeling that there must be like big backroom deals, but there really aren't as many backroom deals as you think there might be. The licensing stuff is all backroom. And none of us here really have access to that. That's legal stuff. And that's sort of a pay grade that's above everybody here. But if you want to watch how things get done, talk to folks, hang out with them, 
go by their table, see if they need help at the table. You never know what you might come across. And you start working with them, you volunteer with them, you end up working with them on a more permanent level, uh, on a pay level. It's it's really, this is an industry, and I keep saying this, I'm, I'm going to beat this into everybody. This industry is developing. It's a child. This is an industry that is not just about a teenager age. And this for the manga, anime, and gaming here in America, you're looking at people who are building this industry as uh, at real time. So you have opportunities. You can make opportunities. Um, um, if anyone on here is it lives in Asia or, um, or has family or connections in Asia or just simply wants to visit Singapore, they're used to, I mean, hopefully it, it went virtual and it still exists and it will come back in person once things calm down more. But there's a great annual conference called Translate Singapore. And um, most of the time it's actually pros. So I'm actually thinking about maybe suggesting you, the two of you who are in Japan as possible guests, um, depending on future uh, subtopics, but I just, I was blessed to be invited to be um, the person representing manga, which is a little bit of pressure, um, uh, at, at the oh, one man. year in 2018 where their focus was on comics. Right. Excellent. That's cool. And, and there are comics and uh, conventions that aren't specific mm -hmm. to anime or manga, but there are comics conventions mm -hmm. that also have translation, things like Angelam and TCAF, uh, Toronto Comics Arts Festival. There's a lot of uh, translated comics that are not Japanese. Um, it's a pretty big world out there. And I know Spanish has a lot of comics, French has a lot of comics and manga. They get a lot of manga. Polish has a lot of, has a lot of comics and manga. And those are other places you can look for opportunities. There's a lot <coughs> more manga in Germany these days. So keep your eyes open and, and definitely look for opportunities and places where you can meet folks um so i yes zach you had one more thing i don't know how to raise the hand feature so i tried i'll just raise my actual hand okay. um i just wanted to say something that erica said also like if you go to conventions and as someone that works behind those tables i guarantee every single person behind the table would rather be talking to you um there's nothing worse than being at a convention and sitting there by yourself and watching everyone just walk by zoom 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 so don't be shy um go up and talk to those people behind the tables they would be delighted to talk to you absolutely absolutely, absolutely. i agree um and so okay i have one more question and i think uh this one was from mari i think this is a great question to wrap up on uh before we have final thoughts from all of you so uh why don't you all tell us what your latest projects if you can tell us about that or and uh, what future topics do you think the workshop ought to cover so we'll we'll do that so jennifer has jennifer you have a thought jennifer <laughs> i do sorry i i can't give specifics but i'm currently working on um accessibility for all languages and by that i mean um Specifically, we're working on subtitles for hard of hearing for video games, but nice. localizing them into every language. Nice. And so I think we need to have more intersection between um, accessibility features. Uh, this, this mostly applies to video games, uh, accessibility features and localization beyond just Japanese to English, like mm -hmm. other languages are all, it, like I said, it's all interconnecting, like other languages really do depend on good English translations. And so it kind of feeds in together both as a translation side, as well as accessibility features and things like that. No, I didn't explain good. it well. I think I got no. too excited. No, it's good. There's, there's actually a thread yeah. today on Twitter about somebody talking about accessibility issues with Elden mm -hmm. Ring, which is the hot oh, new yeah. game right now as we're recording. And I thought, well, yeah, I mean, this is an issue that absolutely, this is an important issue. Yeah. Sorry, Zach, you were saying. No, I just, I, I love that, Jennifer, because I, I try to explain to people how much translation is an accessibility issue because yeah. in my own life, we can watch TV or not watch TV depending on if they have Japanese subtitles or not, you know? And so if you're like, did you see that? I'm like, no, why not? Well, because they didn't add subtitles to their accessibility features. And so we didn't. Yeah. Um, like Disney Plus, I love Disney Plus. They add probably 15, maybe 20 languages to every single show. Um, and then you look at Amazon and they have nothing. And it's crazy, the difference. It's mm -hmm. true. I pretty mm -hmm. much keep subtitles on 
all the time now on literally everything I watch because my wife and I are getting older and it's getting harder to hear and everybody whispers all the time on mainstream <laughs> TV and we can't understand a word that anybody is saying it's all dark mm -hmm. and whispering and it's like well why even watch a TV show so mm -hmm. I agree with these as well the issues in in a parallel world where I had more free time <laughs> I there's a dream of mine that I want to learn signing in both Japanese and English, because I also found out that ASL is different English from ASL. JSL. Yeah. And be an interpreter in sign as well. Right. Or at least maybe I, learn Japanese sign language so I could interpret for Japanese um, signers at US events. That'd be cool. So That's something I've been interested in as well. And two brains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, but uh, in terms of current topics, I too cannot give too many specifics. Um, although in my case, it's just that I haven't bothered to ask whether I can talk about it yet or not. Um, but I'm working on a project that's ancillary or um, kind of a side project related to an Oscar nominated film. Ooh, Ooh nice. awesome. Nice. Very cool, pachi, pachi, pachi. Anybody else working on anything fun? Yes, Sarah Moon. Uh, I also cannot talk about it at the moment, um, but eventually I should be able to finally talk about something. Um, I think it's been greenlit, um, but all I can say at the moment is I'm working in some capacity on an anime dub. And um, I think nice. in the future workshops, it'd be cool to have a workshop on ADR, like just um, anime dubbing yeah, is another thing that has come topic. super yes, far ADR would be great. in recent years. I was just astounded by how good um, the English language, I don't know about the other language dubs, but uh, English language anime dubs have, are just so good now. So like when I used to see them, when I used to see them in the 90s, like, pfft. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even those were pretty good, uh, yeah. to be honest. But like, yeah, the they're names. so... It was the way they pronounced names. It was just yeah, horrible. Yeah, they're, they're just, they're so good now. They're and, so good um, now. Yeah. So good now. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Jennifer Sherman, you had your hand up? Yeah, well, I can say <laughs> the exciting thing I'm working right now. Um, I'm most excited about these Demon Slayer novels I'm working on right now. They're <laughs> two days before my workshop for this, actually, but I think I didn't get a chance to mention it. Um, but yeah, very excited to be working on this newest set of three light novels. So Flower of Happiness, Demon Slayer coming out in October. I was in the Japanese bookstore just yesterday and it was Demon Slayer store. Yeah. There was so much Demon Slayer stuff. Um, yes, Louise, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, um, I'm totally allowed to talk about what I'm working on, hey. so that's great. In fact, my publisher would be thrilled. <laughs> um, I'm uh, in June. The sequel to The Honjin Murders is coming Ooh, out. Yay. Uh, death, death on Gokumon Island. They, Excellent. They threw in death on because they thought nobody would know it was a uh, a mystery if it was just Gokumon Island. So Excellent. I don't know. But anyway, I look forward to reading that. Um, so I'm in the final stages of uh, final checking the proofs of, of that at the moment. And um, yeah, it should be really fun. It's actually the sequel to Honzi Mergers, even though they've brought out a couple of other in the, in the Kindaichi Kosuke series earlier. They've messed around with the order. The English publishers don't care about things like that. No, they don't do that. But anyway, but I Honda Murders was the first and Gokumon Island is the second and there are a couple of others in the, out there too. So read mine first. Not yeah, because right. Of Absolutely mine. read it. Read, not and read Hunger because... Murders, it was great. It was great fun. My wife and I spent every night just going, well, we pretty much guessed what the big red herring was, but then we couldn't <laughs> figure out what was going on. It was great. Um, so Zach, what are you working on? I'm so proud I learned how to use the raise hand feature. Yay! So yeah, that's what I was working on today. Working on but um, yeah, so my biggest thing that I've been really excited to work on is Demon Days from Marvel, which is not right. a translation because I am a writer as well as a translator. Um, and I also got to work on Star Wars Visions, which was an absolute thrill because I am a lifelong Star Wars fan. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. And I that's one of the things I actually really like doing is, is working on translation of Japanese stuff that's not in the the manga industry you know the dedicated manga industry and i love seeing more and more of that leakage i guess you get you know like because people see the success of manga and so marvel wants to sort of like capitalize on that and do their own stuff and so that's been fun to sort of like stand on those bridges in between cool excellent and sarah 
Um, so I've spent uh, like eight years lettering manga and it's localized comics. And recently I've started lettering English language comics. Cool, so I yeah. actually have to draw the balloon. Yay. It's really exciting. I'm using Illustrator, but uh, it kind of feels like I've learned lettering backwards. <laughs> like, like I've spent so long lettering, but I've never made a balloon before. And I've read so many comics that I feel like, yeah, I could definitely do this. But now that I'm doing it, I'm like, oh my God. And I'm constantly having to look at Blambot's lettering book, like for the smallest, most mundane things, just because I'm like gaslighting myself. <laughs> like, no, that's not the way that you make a connector between balloons. Like, yeah, no, it is. It's fine. <laughs> and that's awesome, Sarah, because as I'm sure you know by now, Western comics also pay a lot, 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 lot better. Like, yeah, that's maybe true. three, four times better than manga. There's nowhere near as much work, though. So. That is tr also true, yes. Right. And I am currently working on a book about Yuri Manga, which will be out in June, and we are getting there. It's There are so many pieces, and you all know this because you're all part of this. There are so many pieces to publishing. It is unbelievable. People who do not make books have no idea how many wheels are turning, plates are being spun, balls are being juggled all at the same time. And it's, it's amazing that anything ever gets done, frankly. <laughs> so I'm always amazed about that. Um, I want to ask you all, does anybody have any last words for our audience, for the workshop attendees, or for anybody who might want to attend the workshop next year? I think chat is disabled for anybody that's not Oh, really? There. I'm sorry. Yeah. Chat oh. yeah, I've been looking for questions and things. Yeah. Oh, nobody's got any questions. I, I would just say, like, you know, keep in touch. Like, if this, if you're interested in working in translation, you know, let this be the start of your journey, I guess, rather than the end. You know, it's, it's, it's a long road. You know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So, you know, keep in touch. Keep chatting on the Discord, you know, and uh, yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else? Well, I want to say that from my perspective, I have learned so much from all of you, and I hope you'll all come back next year. Um, and uh, we'll add a few other people I know. David Evelyn has said he's interested in joining us, so I'd really like to get his perspective because he's like a superstar right now. Um, and just generally, I think learning all the time from as many people as you can, just be a giant sponge and be willing to fail because some of the stories we learned in this workshop was I tried and I failed and then I tried again and I failed and then I did it and maybe it wasn't great or I did it and maybe this now I wouldn't have done it this way and I know certainly the work that I did um, 20 years ago is not the work that I'm doing now and in 20 years I'll look at the work that I'm doing now and be like oh why did you do that but that's part of growing and if you're afraid of failing you'll never grow so that, that's my advice for everybody who's, who's wants to be any kind of working and publishing in any way, actually working, actually leaving the house and doing anything of any kind ever, be ready to fail and, and grow and learn from that. So that's my advice. Anybody else? Any last words? Um, I didn't mention it, but um, for the literary world, it's, it's hard to break into literary translation. Um, but um, like I said earlier, take part in events, take part in workshops. But I did add, wanted to add um, one th more thing. If take part, try competitions. There are a few competitions for up and coming literary translators. There are never any competitions for established ones. It always pisses me off. But anyway, uh, there are plenty of competitions for up and coming literary translators. Take a look around, Google it, um, have a go. I recommended this to someone who wanted to break into literary translation a couple of years ago, and he got a, a commended prize in the JLPP uh, literary translation. So now he's probably going to have a career. Excellent. And it's really a good idea to try those if you if you can find them. Yeah, super. And do you I have a question of that? Do you get feedback when you're done? When you've done the, the contest stuff? Have, do they give you feedback on what you've done? I don't know because I only found out about the competitions once I'd already published something which made me ineligible for the competition. <laughs> they only but, give feedback uh, yeah. to the winners, unfortunately. 
Okay. As someone oh. who's entered the JLPP a few oh, times. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Jennifer okay. Sherman, you have something you want to add? We have talked about this, but here's your friendly reminder that for breaking into, especially this industry, probably any industry is just networking. Um, you have to talk to people. I'm sorry to tell you as a very uh, social anxiety person, I still have to tell you, you have to talk to people. And yeah, you never know what connections are gonna like lead to something. You, it's, it's amazing. You'll be so surprised. It could be mm -hmm. somebody you haven't talked to in three years, then you suddenly talk to them and then there's an opportunity you never thought of, you know? Yeah. So yeah, get out there. Yeah, excellent. And I'll also say online stuff absolutely helps with that because you can practice talking to people about professional things in a, in that, semi-professional space that we all seem to inhabit because all of us are professionals but none of us are professional you know we all talk about the stuff we enjoy all the time and so you do that online and you can keep doing it till you get it right mari you have a thought and i was going to piggyback on um jennifer sherman in that also like practice outside what you think would be the normal realm or group circle that you think it would come in handy. This is um, kind of a reverse case, but I now do um, export exams for Japanese dog show um, breeders, handlers, owners, um, when they bring their dogs to New York or the area to compete in dog shows. Um, because I was at a dog show and I started, to, I, I noticed someone hurrying, but looking around kind of like, I don't know where I'm going. And I said, can I help you? And we started talking. I was like, I, would you mind if I ask if you're from Japan? And it turned out she was. And the reason why we clicked was because she is the co-founder and um, what's the term? Shoot, I can't remember the English term, um, but she's like the second in command of a figure company in Japan. So we bonded over our pop culture connection and, and, and on top of our love of dogs. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, talk to people. That's really always the key, right? So super. Um, does anybody have any last thoughts? Is that it? Okay. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you, everybody who sat here and listened for this round table, every, all of you who came to the workshop um, it was fantastic. Uh, I had a great time. I learned a ton of stuff from all of you. And um, I just really want to thank you all. And I hope we will see you again next year. And I certainly we'll see you online. Thank you very much and have a great night. Love you all. Yay. Bye, 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 bye. Hey, bye, 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 bye,